A few days ago, we were all just sitting there watching the Super Bowl, and Bad Robot dropped a new Cloverfield movie faster than Tom Brady managed to drop that Lombardi trophy. But before I can get into the things you missed in this new Cloverfield movie, let's do a quick recap of everything in the Cloverfield films and ARG so far, because I will be referencing back to them. If you aren't familiar with ARGs, it stands for Alternate Reality Game. In other words, it's a viral marketing technique that was used to create buzz for each of these movies, primarily through the creation of websites and Twitter accounts that live within the Cloverfield universes. They typically drop cryptic clues and leave fans to decipher their meaning to unlock the next piece of the puzzle. And one other thing, the Clover ARGs are considered canon. So, most of the ARG for the first Cloverfield movie takes place on the Tagruato website. If you aren't familiar, Tagruato is a Japanese mining company considered to be the most advanced in the world and known for their deep sea oil drilling stations that can drill miles and miles further underwater than their competitors. Some people believe it is one of these drilling stations in the Atlantic that awakened the dormant Cloverfield monster, or possibly monsters, in 2008. But aside from deep sea drilling, they also own several subsidiary companies, like Yoshida Medical Research, a deep sea bioprospecting company. What the heck does that mean? Basically, they study deep sea creatures in extreme environments to see how they survive and how that can be applied for human survival. Tagruato also owns a technology firm called Bold Futura, which develops technology for military and space exploration. That includes developing satellites, so obviously we'll be coming back to that one. Then there's Parafun Wax Distributors, though it's unclear how that one ties in with the other subsidiaries. The last one is a beverage company called Slusho, the company that Rob, from the first Cloverfield, was planning to move to Japan to manage. Slusho famously uses a secret ingredient called deep sea nectar, known to make the consumer feel happy and have numerous health benefits. Some people believe that this nectar is extracted from the egg of the Cloverfield monster, and that the drilling station in the Atlantic near New York City is actually collecting this nectar. This is because the parasites that come off the monster are found to have high levels of nectar in their blood. And that leads us into the first ARG, which is about a group of extreme environmental activists known as Tidal Wave, who go to this Atlantic station to try to expose Tagruato for some kind of dark secret that they're supposedly hiding there. The station is destroyed in late 2007, and Tagruato blames this extremist group for attacking it. However, I'll show you the video and let you be the judge of what happened. The incident is being coined an environmental disaster and a matter of life and death for almost 300 individuals aboard the large deep sea drilling platform. It went down days ago and only now are we beginning to learn details regarding the oil rig collapse and what may have caused such a devastating accident. This dramatic home video captured by eyewitnesses on the scene shows a large oil rig in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean suddenly sinking under violent and unexplained circumstances. The destruction of the Chuai drilling station happening dangerously close to the coast of Connecticut, sending hundreds of workers scrambling for help as a large oil rig collapsed. Video footage shot earlier shows signs oil is possibly seeping from the big rig into the sea. The dark shape below the surface appears to be an oil spill that could easily mean a nightmare for the shoreline of Connecticut. Yeah, oil spill. Shortly after, this happens. The final extraordinary clip clearly shows the sheer speed and power of the sinking vessel. It appears that the oil rig is being sucked down at a dramatic rate, but what caused the shower of debris that followed remains a matter for intense speculation. Shortly after, in May 2008, New York City is attacked on the evening of Rob's going away party. His brother Jason is killed by what appears to be a tentacle monster destroying Brooklyn Bridge. Rob finds out that Beth, the girl that he's in love with, is trapped in her apartment. He sets out to rescue her and is joined by his late brother's girlfriend Lily and his friend Hud, who serves as the cameraman, and Marlena, a girl from the party. Marlena gets bit by a parasite and dies, they save Beth, and Lily gets away on chopper number 402. Rob, Beth, and Hud aren't so lucky, and that's where the first movie ends. Mm, yeah, we'll do Okay, yeah, all right, all right, we're almost on tape. We got like three seconds left. I can't say for sure quite yet, but there's a good chance that everything in 10 Cloverfield Lane and its ARG take place in another dimension, where the New York City attack hasn't happened yet. 
And I promise this all ties back into the Cloverfield Paradox, so hang with me. In 2009, a military analyst named Howard Stambler joins Bold Futura, the satellite company I told you about, and seven years later, he's honored on Tagaruato's website as Employee of the Month. According to the website, Howard's drive, commitment, and refusal to accept easy answers resulted in a significant breakthrough diagnosing transmission complications with two of their government satellites. At some point, Howard's ex-wife takes custody of their daughter Megan, and he goes a bit crazy, creating a website designed to appeal to her and send her secret messages. Meanwhile, he's building a doomsday bunker. He later kidnaps young girls and makes them wear Megan's old clothes to fill the gap left by his daughter. In 2016, he uses the secret website to urge his daughter to run away from her mother and come take cover in his doomsday shelter, suggesting that something huge is about to happen. His daughter never shows up, and Howard gets desperate and finds someone to fill the role of his daughter during the attack, and that person is Michelle, the protagonist of 10 Cloverfield Lane. Howard finds her at the Kelvin gas station, follows her, knocks her off the road, and she wakes up in the bunker. It's just her, Howard, and a man named Emmett who helped Howard build the bunker. When Emmett and Michelle find out that Howard was lying about his daughter, they devise plans for Michelle to escape. Howard finds out about the plans and kills Emmett, but Michelle gets out to find that the air is clean, but worm-like aliens have taken over the earth. She escapes towards a possible survivor's camp, which is the end of 10 Cloverfield Lane. But the ARG extends a little bit past that. A box left by Howard is found containing data about a particle detector from the International Space Station that picked up two huge bursts followed by a massive red flash that occurred everywhere, presumably the same event described by Emmett at the beginning of the cataclysm. The next event happens in January 2018, not long before the release of The Cloverfield Paradox, so I'm gonna go ahead and fire up that Things You Missed counter machine that I have. Let's just take a short commercial break while I do that. The ARG for the Cloverfield Paradox actually began in real life in summer 2017 at San Diego Comic Con, where fans could actually purchase a slusho from the mobile slusho truck at the event. Each slusho flavor had its own robot mascot, which is probably due to the fact that the studio behind the films is Bad Robot. There's actually a seventh robot, who was a combination of each flavor. The seventh robot appeared on the Slusho Snapchat filter. If you aligned the seventh robot in the blank space of the truck and showed the Snapchat to the Slusho employee, you were asked to fill out a form to win a prize for solving the puzzle. And that would be just the beginning, though. On January 18th, which happens to be the 10-year anniversary of the original Cloverfield, the Tagurato website is updated. But upon trying to access it, you'll receive an error message. However, examining the image behind the error message leads to a text post that reads as follows. Tokyo, January 18th, 2018. Tagruato has begun development on a revolutionary new energy technology in what CEO Ganu Yoshida called a technological great leap forward for our planet. This renewable energy will take at least four years to complete, along with another six years international regulatory bodies to bring this powerful revolutionary energy source by April 18th, 2028. I think we can make the conclusion that the energy technology referenced is Shepard from the Cloverfield Paradox. I believe that the ARG, like the other two ARGs before it, take place in real time, here in 2018. The movie, which doesn't occur until the Shepard exists, takes place in 2028. The thing I'm not sure about yet is whether it takes place in Dimension A, the Cloverfield universe, Dimension B, the 10 Cloverfield Lane universe, or Dimensions C and D, two theoretical, entirely new universes. I'll give my arguments for each possibility as we progress, but I think whatever dimension the movie takes place in is not our dimension, the one that you're watching this video in right now. I'd say internet browsers in that universe work slightly different, so if we access the web page in Google Chrome, Firefox, or other popular web browsers from our universe, the page glitches out. I wouldn't rule out the possibility that someone in our dimension can build a browser that will read the page properly. Maybe we just haven't discovered it yet in the ARG. Moving forward, not much happens on the website until January 27th, when it becomes possible to spot a graphic about something called the Cloverfield Energy Initiative. This time, there's a faded handwriting on top of the graphic, but manipulating the image allows us to see the true message. It says, Someone needs to stop this from happening. This is nothing but a cover for a reckless experiment that will reset the world's grid. Stop this to save the world. Tidal Wave. If you'll remember, Tidal Wave is the same group that opposed Tagurato's deep-sea drilling project back in the era of the original Cloverfield ARG. 
Also on January 27th, the first winners of the Slusho Truck Puzzle Challenge I mentioned earlier received their prizes in the mail. The prize package included a Slusho bobblehead, a certificate of congratulations with trademarks registered by Bold Futura, the satellite company Howard Stambler worked for, and a pamphlet version of the Cloverfield Energy Initiative graphic spotted on the background of the Tagurato website. The most recent update to the Tagurato website introduces a Hebrew news article from 2007 that talks about road closures near the Dead Sea, possibly because of sinkholes. As a reminder, that would be a little over a year before the New York City attack. That is, if it even happens on this timeline. Let's go back to the release date of Tagarato's new energy source, April 18, 2028. If you go to 0418-2028.com, a distorted video plays. This page also continued to update over the course of January, and we get little bits of information piece by piece from what appears to be a guy wearing glasses. Some of the lines that we can make out include the following. A male voice says, This is what I'm trying to warn you about, the dangers of what Tagaruato is trying to do. In an update, a female voice can be heard saying, Welcome to the show, Cloverfield Station, joining us today, controversy, Mark Stambler, author of the book. So this Mark Stambler has the same last name as Howard Stambler, the guy who built the bunker in 10 Cloverfield Lane. The last update from the 0418-2028 website looks like this. In case he couldn't make it out, Mark Stambler says the experiment could unleash chaos, the likes of which we have never seen. You have no idea how much I would love to be wrong about this. It would be no fun for me to be right. If you want to know more, read my book. There was also a Mark Stambler Twitter account at one point. Some users who attempted to DM the account received a message containing more cryptic videos. Unfortunately, they're very hard to decipher because he actually sent them as vertical videos of the computer screen as opposed to just sending the actual video file. The account is no longer up, and the only tweets were about some hoax at the university he works at and how he had to notify NYPD about someone watching him. This information doesn't actually tie directly into the movie, but I just thought I would mention it because it tells us more about the character and it makes me think that someone from Tagaruato has a reason to keep an eye on this Mark Stambler character. Okay, so as of right now, that's as much as we know from the ARG, but before I tell you the things you missed from the movie, there's one more thing I'd like to point out in the trailer. It says, 10 years ago, something arrived. Now, find out why. Then it immediately cuts to a shot of the Shepherd. I would say that could support the idea that the Cloverfield Paradox takes place in Dimension A, but the event caused by the firing of the Shepherd could take place across multiple dimensions, which I will explain later in this video. Early in the movie, Ava and Michael are in a huge line at the gas station, and it's the fictional Kelvin gas station, which is also where Michelle stops to get gas in 10 Cloverfield Lane. If you pause on that shot, you can also get an idea of how bad the energy crisis discussed in the movie really is. The sign says, gas available today, as if that is a rarity, and it costs $30 a gallon. There's also another appearance towards the end of the movie, which may suggest that Kelvin was in on the Cloverfield Energy Initiative. When Ava gets back in the car, she asks her husband if he's moved yet, and he jokes, Forward or side to side? However, this could also be a foreshadowing of the journey taken by those aboard the Cloverfield Station later in this film. If you're looking at a timeline, they continue to move forward in time, but they also go sideways into a different dimension. And while we're on this topic, I think now is a good time to bring up the logo and poster of this movie. And before you start to say that it's just a poster and it doesn't matter, remember that we have seen clues on the Cloverfield posters before, but this time I specifically want to look at the logo. If we look at the 10 Cloverfield Lane poster, it has one timeline leading from the Cloverfield text to the place where the movie takes place. But this Cloverfield Paradox poster looks all too familiar for someone who spent time studying split timelines. The logo is definitely supposed to represent the timelines of the two dimensions occupied by the Cloverfield station. One of them comes off the letter L, which could mean that the dimension that they travel to is dimension B from 10 Cloverfield Lane. Before they get their gasoline, there's a blackout, which Ava says is the fourth or fifth one of the day. In both prequels, the calamity started with a blackout or multiple blackouts. What you care about the most? Oh, oh, oh god! Oh, 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 oh my god! What the hell was that? Oh, oh. Power has still not been restored to many cities on the southern seaboard in the wake of this afternoon's 
During the opening title sequence on board the station, we see the team picture of the international crew. After they cross over to the other dimension, a different photo is seen. They also have this tank of worms, which is supposed to be there to consume bacteria, but they disappear after crossing over. Worms are later found inside of Volkov, but these worms look much smaller compared to the ones in the tank. If the dimension that they travel to really is Dimension B, then it could be possible that the disappearance of the worms aboard the spacecraft is related to the appearance of vicious worm-like aliens in 10 Cloverfield Lane. Let me know what you think in the comments. Ava has a video chat with her husband where he tries to bring up the idea that maybe they should try to go back and have kids again after the accidental death of their first two kids in a fire. However, the ripple created by the firing of the shepherd seems to occur at different places on the timeline in different dimensions, so maybe the idea of going back in time isn't that far-fetched. It also sets up the later plot point where Ava finds herself with an opportunity to save her children in the other dimension. While they're preparing to fire up the shepherd again, Acosta tunes in to an Earthican TV broadcast, and we finally get to see the full video that had been teased on the 0418 2028 website, with Mark Stambler being interviewed live. The title of his book is The Cloverfield Paradox, and his Twitter handle is at Paradox is Real, which is a real account created in January, the same time the online portion of the ARG started, but it hasn't posted anything yet. Here's what Mark has to say about it. smashing together multiple dimensions, shattering reality, and not just on that station, everywhere. This experiment could unleash chaos, the likes of which we have never seen. Monsters, demons, beasts from the sea. So while this guy may appear to be crazy for the time being, he turns out to be 100% right. So where does he get this information? Let's also not forget that Mark's brother, Howard Stambler, knew exactly when the calamity was going to hit in 10 Cloverfield Lane, and what it was going to entail. In the ARG, he tries to get his daughter to come down to his bunker well in advance. He knows he's low on time before the disaster happens, so he knocks Michelle off the road. Emmett explains that he was nearby right when the huge flash hit and he raced straight to the bunker, where Howard was already closing the door. Howard knew exactly how to prepare for what was coming, and he did. So the question is, how did these brothers effectively predict the future when nobody else could? That could be a question answered in another movie. Let's continue Mark's speech. And not just here and now, in the past, in the future, in other dimensions. This could be the key to understanding how everything we've seen so far is linked. Let's assume for a moment that we're dealing with four entirely different dimensions. Maybe at the time that the Shepherd overloads in Dimension C, Dimension A is still only in 2008, and so the Cloverfield incident occurs. Maybe at the same time in Dimension B, it's still 2016, so the 10 Cloverfield Lane attack hits. And maybe Dimension D is parallel, and the event destroys their Cloverfield station. There is more evidence, outside of just taking Mark Stambler's word for it, to suggest that this is one event taking place in multiple timelines at different times. Let's revisit Emmett's description of the event that triggered the cataclysm in 10 Cloverfield Lane. The attack, I saw myself. What do you mean? I was on my way home from work. And it looked like a flash. Bright red. Like an explosion from way far off. It wasn't like fireworks. No, this was more like something you read about in the Bible. So what you saw, what, a flash of light? Lightning? A, a fire that flared up? I'm not explaining it right. This wasn't like anything I'd ever seen. Seems awfully familiar after seeing the Cloverfield Paradox. Another connection to 10 Cloverfield Lane can be found in Michael's social media feed after the first explosion. First of all, I do hope we're running on a 7G network in the next 10 years, but the posts are all talking about a huge noise, several missing city blocks, and part of the city in rubble. But one of the posts is a question asking if anyone's been outside and wondering if the air is safe to breathe. A quick note, when Michael saves the little girl, he puts on a cartoon for her called Bleep Bloop, which appears to be about the mascot of the production company Bad Robot, but could also have something to do with the robot flavors seen on the side of the slusho truck. It's more likely to be a reference to Bad Robot, since the credits say the animation was created by J.J. Abrams and Ben Schwartz, and Bad Robot is J.J. Abrams' company. Here's another interesting bit. 
During the shepherd overload, the whole station starts shaking and we see a shot of the slusho bobblehead, the same one that the Comic-Con fans in 2017 were given for solving the slusho puzzle. This is the first of many parallels to the first Cloverfield movie. Another theory that I have is that the dimension that the Cloverfield paradox takes place in is the same as dimension A, except for the fact that the Cloverfield incident hasn't happened yet. This time, instead of happening in New York City, it's happening in space. An early reference to Slusho just before the disaster strikes is one of many parallels we'll see. When they first find and rescue Mina, she has a beam lodged in her shoulder in the same spot that Beth is impaled by a beam when they rescue her in the original Cloverfield. Speaking of Beth, she reaches out to Rob via her cell phone to let him know that she's trapped in her apartment. Michael reads on his cell phone about one of his friends being trapped in an apartment after the calamity hits. The person is trapped in 402 PA Street. That may or may not be related to helicopter number 402, which Lily gets taken away in during the first movie. In this shot, we can see a monster in the background wrecking a city with huge skyscrapers. It's assumed that this is somewhere in the UK, but we never find out what city it is. And finally, in order to save the space station, they have to prevent it from tilting off axis by 25 degrees. Beth's apartment is also tilting off axis by just under 25 degrees. They end up going to the building next to it, and the three main characters have to traverse the ruins of the roof to get to the door that they need to get to. The scene where the astronauts had to cross over to get to the other part of the space station is almost identical. Then there's the villain of the movie. In this movie, Mina is portrayed as the villain, even though she's just trying to help her own planet. We don't know a whole lot about Clover, but it appears that the destruction caused by it is just due to its self-defense instincts as well. When we first discover Mina, they hear the sounds of Clover's roar on the other side of the wall, and when Mina is on the attack at the end of the movie, we also hear the distant sound of that roar. And of course, Cloverfield ends with a mysterious object, which is assumed to be a satellite or space shuttle crashing into the Atlantic Ocean, which is exactly where the pod from the Cloverfield Paradox lands. And while this does answer some questions about what caused the calamity in each movie, it also raises plenty of questions. What role did Tagaruato have in the opening of this space-time tear? And how do all of these films fit together? I'm going to talk about the three most plausible scenarios. Scenario number one. The Cloverfield Paradox takes place in its own universe, Dimension C. The firing of the Shepherd causes space-time tears in all four dimensions, and monsters, creatures from the sea, and demons travel to Earth through these tears. The event pushes the Cloverfield Station into Dimension D, and when they overload the Shepherd again, they push themselves back into Dimension C. This would explain why there's never any mention of a previous calamity in either sequel, and why Clover appears to be much, much bigger than the monster in Cloverfield. This is the easiest and least creative scenario, and it wastes the opportunity to tie in the object landing at the end of Cloverfield to the shuttle landing in Paradox. Scenario number two. The Cloverfield Paradox takes place in Dimension A, 20 years after the New York Cloverfield incident. After the events of Cloverfield, the monster is captured or goes back into hiding. However, an accident caused by Yoshida Medical Research causes their cellular growth accelerant, used for healing injured humans, to blow Clover up to a much bigger, more destructive size. When they fire the Shepherd, this process is sped up and it creates a disaster on Earth, while the space station is pushed into Dimension B. The paradox causes a huge flash which gets the attention of the aliens, possibly the Martians. Russians are developing some nasty stuff and if the Martians finally figured out a way to get here, their weapons will make the Ruskies look like, like, like sticks and stones. Who is set to wipe out human life on Earth. They fire the Shepherd again and come back to Dimension A at the end to find it in ruins. Scenario number three. The Cloverfield Paradox takes place in Dimension C. The Shepherd tears space-time so that disasters also happen in 2008 and 2016 in Dimension A and B, respectively. When the Shepherd is fired, they travel to Dimension B or D. But when it's fired again to get back home, they actually unknowingly go to Dimension A, which is similar to their dimension, but Clover has been growing and on the loose for over 20 years. But that, of course, still doesn't solve the question of what landed in the water at the end of Cloverfield. Unless... Scenario number four, they went back in time to 2008 Dimension A, but that doesn't explain why Clover is awake and giant at the time of their landing. 
while in Cloverfield there was no issue until a month after the object landed. There are so many possibilities here, so if you have your own theories, leave them in the comments. I'd love to piece this one together, but chances are we won't get answers until a future movie. And there's also a possibility that the ARG for this movie isn't over yet, so if you'd like to see me cover any updates we might see, let me hear in the comments on that one as well. If you were confused at any point in this video, go ahead and leave a like. My name is CZ and I love talking about psychological horror, but honestly, my brain is pretty racked on this one. But regardless, I'll be back with new horrors every week, so make sure you subscribe to CZ's World and ring the death bell so you can see those, and I'll see you in the next one, assuming we both survive.